I love the chase and the hunt and I set the pace when I'm running. I always take what I want and I always give it 100. Don't need a bank, no, I'm funded. Play the game like it's nothing. I'm always thankful for something. Don't take for granted, stay humble. Now wake up! It's time to look at the enemy. What's up, everybody, and welcome to The Comment Writers. Uh, we're back. This is episode 14. I'm your host. My name is Josh Meek, the Uber Geek, joined, as always, by Toby Tobes. What's up, Toby? Not much, Josh. Josh, I have a question for you. Oh, I would love to give you an answer. Thank you. Did you ever see those stories on the news where, like, there will be a city, like a small town or a couple blocks in a city where everyone's like, there's some random, like, resonance noise that just echoes throughout the neighborhood for days on end and drives everyone insane? I have. Yes. Yes. I am pretty sure that's happening down the street from my house. Oh, no. (laughs) What does it sound like? I don't know if that's a question or not. Maybe more of a statement. <laughs> but <laughs> I have there's a question like, for you. This whenever, thing is happening to me. <laughs> whenever I'm outside for at least like the past two, three weeks, all you hear is like, it's almost like a metallic hum. Just like, hmm, oh, like that... real loud any time of day outside. That seems bad. Is it? Is there like construction happening anywhere, anywhere around you or anything? No, but so there's a lot of radio towers around here. Oh, no. And satellite dishes. And it seems like it's coming from the vague area of one of the bigger radio towers. <laughs> you should you should uh, figure out who owns that tower and like call the station and be like, have you guys changed anything recently? <laughs> Am I going to die? <laughs> they all deny it. They're all jerks. Have you called <laughs> or have other people called? Oh, uh, I don't know. I don't talk to my neighbors. Come on now. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. Is, is this to the point where it has, uh, has, has swirled up into a neighborhood controversy or is, is our, or, or are you just on your own so far in this, uh, in this investigation? I'm on my own in this investigation, but <laughs> the last time anything when they're remotely close, I had to call, um, there's an AT&T tower in the, my general area as well. And I don't get AT&T reception at my house. So when I called them and I was like, yo, the tower doesn't work. I live half a mile from it. I get no reception. They said, oh, that's too bad. And then that was pretty much the end of the conversation. <laughs> oh, bummer. That's, that's, that's a real bummer. <laughs> I do think there is a weird like dead zone when if you're too close to a tower sometimes. I've definitely seen that before where it's like it's literally right there. Why is this not working? And I think it's like, yeah, there's like a w- weird like halo effect or something. But I don't, yeah, I, I definitely grew up in a place. Where, I think there's things that are going to kill you basically everywhere. But um, I grew up kind of out in the country, but in a place that was like there was a lot of like power lines and stuff overhead in a lot of cases. And sometimes I would like look up at those and think like, that's probably not great. Just like being being overhead all the time. And yeah, sometimes you would hear like hums and noises and stuff kind of coming from from things like that. It's like. Yeah, that's probably this is probably not good. Well, the power lines at least make sense to me because I know there's shit running through those. And on the bright side of that, they decided that even though people that lived underneath power lines forever usually seem to have issues, at some point they decided, no, it doesn't do anything. So you're fine. Because <laughs> it was easier to decide that probably than to decide that anything needed to change. <laughs> that's, that's always the fun, fun conspiracy theory. So don't put the picture I sent you in chat on the video, please. <laughs> you, you, you don't want to dox where you live? <laughs> no, I'm not Your trying to dox address. myself. But this is the this is the uh, a map of how close I am to where AT&T's building is and where the noise is coming from. Wait, and as you, you can see, it's very close. You've, you've highlighted this section and labeled it noise. So, so you can tell the noise is like directional. Like you can tell it's coming from a specific direction. Yeah, I definitely know like it's coming from I think there's something next to the AT&T building. Like there's some sort of like weird government chained off building back there because I've walked next to it outside the chains. Oh. And it's like this is under surveillance. If you cross over the fence, we're definitely calling the cops on you. Oh, interesting. So I think whatever that place is is making the noise, but there's also an observatory up here because I live on top of a mountain ish. So I don't know if like they're calling like aliens and at and <laughs> involved somehow. And there's some weird conspiracy in the top of the mountain here, but there's shit going down. Have you, have you gone to the other side of the, where you think the noise is coming from to see, to like basically confirm that that's the source of the noise. 
I haven't gone towards the noise since the noise has come because I don't know what's going to happen if I do. Oh, interesting. I'm definitely going to spend like the rest of the night on Google Maps, like looking around <laughs> this area because I'm super curious now about the the government area you're talking about. <laughs> All right, we're gonna we're gonna dig into this conspiracy. <laughs> Toby and Josh are now officially Hardy Boys on the case. <laughs> Always have been. <laughs> I don't know what a more modern reference for instead of Hardy Boys is, but that's that's what I've got. <laughs> blues Clues. We're we're we're, we're, blues, we're blues Clues in this thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's troubling. I definitely have, like you said, heard stories about just like yeah, random noise that that people have in uh, in their neighborhoods. I also went down a weird um, rabbit hole recently about basically fake buildings. Are you familiar with, with this concept? Hit me. Okay. So what this is, is there will be, you know, buildings that are required for the continued existence of society or the continued running of a city, but that are kind of eyesores. So like, one example is like, you know, a, a power station, like a big power transformation station. And it maybe it needs to be in like a residential area and it looks terrible. So to kind of make it less of an eyesore and make people happy, they'll basically put up the facade of a real house. But inside, it's like the industrial power station. So it looks like a house on the outside, but really it's this power station it's not a real house you couldn't actually live there Um, or another example is there's a subway that runs under a city and it needs giant air vents to kind of create ventilation and to do that again they put up a facade of a building that doesn't have a roof and the inside is completely empty and it just works as the air vent for the subway but from the outside and from the street it looks like a real building so people will go on this, these like, you know, sort of scavenger hunts essentially to find the facades and like notice the fake buildings. And like, it's a fun thing to be like, oh, like I walk past this building every day. Didn't know that it wasn't real. <laughs> didn't know that, you know, someone didn't live here or whatever. So that's that, that's what that reminded me of. Just this like, you know, it's just in a in a neighborhood, this like weird government facility we can't know anything about. But uh, just look the other way. It's <laughs> it's not anything to worry about. How do people even find that shit? Um, I think I think with the rise of, of Google Maps specifically, a lot of that stuff has come to light because especially the ones that are like the subway ventilation shafts like from the street they look normal but from from the bird's eye view obviously you can see like oh there's no roof on this building like it's just a big hole so something weird is is going on here um but i also think a lot of those things aren't um like they're not intentionally hidden that they exist it's just that they're not like publicized so like you could probably like look up records and look up like who owns the land and stuff like that and figure out that oh the government owns it um And then kind of like look up what it's zoned for and stuff like that. So you could probably dig into it and figure it out. It's just that like most people don't care because because who cares? It's just a random building. (laughs) But um, yeah, when you dig into it, it's kind of interesting. And the the, you know, reasoning behind like going the extra mile to make it look like a real building is also kind of really interesting, too. Gotcha. We're learning a lot uh, today. We are. Yeah, (laughs) we're digging into it. Uh, Toby, we should we should learn a little bit more because we got an email this week. Ooh, that that definitely teaches me a lot of good things. <laughs> definitely. Um, if you want to send an email to us, you can send those to cast at commonwritersucks Uh This week, our friend Shade Shade ZZ uh, has sent us an email. Uh, Shade, of course, has written in before with some uh, kind of trivia and information about Common Writer, and uh, now Shade has done the same thing again. So, <coughs> excuse me, jumping oh, right geez. in. I'm dying. I'm dying over here. So jumping right in here to Shade's email. Uh, Shade says, um, Geats' upcoming movie is called Common Rider Geats Cross uh, Revice Movie Battle Royale. So that was the one that uh, last week Kieran was telling us about and telling us that Ryuki uh, is going to be in it. And um, that's what Shade is telling us as well, that Ryuki is going to be in the movie. Um, and it kind of coincides with Ryuki's 20th anniversary. So that is sort of why they're looping Ryuki back in. And there's going to be a Ryuki mini series uh, coming up as well. So um, 
I guess, yeah, if you if Ryuki is interesting, it seems like there's going to be some opportunity to see more Ryuki coming up. Let's do it. Shane says the Kamen Rider usually has three types of movies. The first is a crossover movie with the previous and the new Kamen Rider. Um, other writers might also make an appearance like the Geats' Battle Royale movie. And the second type of movie is their own season's standalone movie. So that's the one that I was telling you was the double feature with the Sentai movie. And then the third type of movie is the post series. So after the move, after the series is completed, uh, these are called V cinema movies and they're basically made to put the spotlight on other characters. Um, or if you just couldn't get enough of the series. So it's like kind of a little like addendum onto the series. Uh, Shane says there's also anniversary movies, but most of the movies uh, fall into the, the other categories there, the other two categories. Um, Kamen Rider and Super Sentai have crossed over a bunch of times. The first official time they've done a crossover is with Kamen Rider Decayed and the Samurai Sentai Shinkenger. Um, Shinkenger got brought over as Power Rangers Samurai. Um, I will say, so me uh, kind of jumping in here. So Decayed and Shinkenger were my sort of first uh, experiences with Kamen Rider and Sentai. And I think Decayed is fun. Uh, I, I like that series a lot, but Shinkenger is incredible. Um, so if, if you ever wanted to check out a Super Sentai that was actually really good, um, I, I would recommend Shinkenger. It's it's really, really fun. You know a lot uh, of things, Josh. I'm just letting you go here. You're you're vibing. <laughs> I, I, I'm always vibing. What am I not vibing? <laughs> <laughs> Shane goes on and tells again that the first big crossover they made is Superhero Tyson. So that was the one that Kieran was talking about uh, last week on the last episode. And it was the full on crossover with all the common writers in, in Sentai. Uh, <laughs> Shane says it's fun and a giant mess. And then, yeah, we, we get the uh, the Toei Toku fan club. So I think last uh, last time or, or a couple episodes ago, I was telling you about there's a streaming service now that the Toei does. Um, that's the streaming service, the Toei Toku Fan Club, the TTFC. And Shade says they do make weird stuff, but it's all for expanding the story beyond the TV series uh, with character spinoffs and crossovers. Then Shade has some trivia for us. So uh, Shade says in Kamen Rider Zio, which is is uh, before Geats was definitely my favorite Kamen Rider series, uh, Shade says there's a character named Common Rider Shinobi in the show. Uh, Shinobi was supposed to be the Common Rider of 2022, but of course Geats came out, and now Shinobi for 2022 became a huge meme. Um, Shade says it sounds like a pre presidential election kind of thing. Exactly, yeah. Shade says low key Shinobi was really cool. Uh, I wouldn't mind if it becomes an official series. So there was a Shinobi mini series that that came out. Um, and, and Shinobi is a pretty cool writer. He's like, obviously a ninja, like, uh, the, the outfit looks really cool. The actual, um, the Kamen Rider suit looks really cool. It's all purple, um, incorporates like ninja stars and stuff. Um, but I'm definitely happy that we got Geats <laughs> for 2022 instead of, instead of Shinobi. Having nothing to compare it to, I like Geats better as well. <laughs> Shade says Geats made uh, his first debut in Kamen Rider Revice's movie. It's a writer tradition where the new writer would make a cameo in the movie, uh, beat the crap out of the bad guys, and say their name before leaving without explaining anything. Uh, That's they, awesome. They, they link to, an, <laughs> to a little clip of that. Um, Ace actually made a, uh, a civilian cameo, so not transformed as Geats, but it just as, as himself, in Kamen Rider Revice's finale. Um, so, so been in kind of Kamen Rider Revice multiple times, really. I wonder if he was the star to the star of the stars at that point or <laughs> not yet. Yeah. I'm not sure what like version of Ace we're getting or kind of like what, um, like how, how in depth basically, but that's, that's interesting. Geats is also, uh, Shade says crossed over recently with the anime Crayon Shin-Chan. So, um, you and I looked up some images of Crayon Shin Chan before we started here. And yeah, we, I definitely recognize kind of the, the main character there in Crayon Shin Chan. I've never watched any of this anime, but like it clearly is big enough that like that character has made it into our sort of purview at some point. Um, I, I watched the little clips that shade has linked here where they're, they're doing like commercials. So they have a, um, a person in 
a costume like as Crayon Shin-chan, who is like standing next to Kamen Rider Geeks and kind of like talking to each other and stuff as they go. It's 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 very cute. Adorable. Some would say it's adorable. <laughs> Uh, Shade says, if I had a nickel for every time Kamen Rider crossed over with Shin-chan, I'd have three nickels because Kamen Rider Denno and Kamen Rider Forze also had a crossover. So I guess that continues to happen, uh, but definitely not every year. So it's it's been pretty intermittent because uh, Denno and Forze, uh, it's been a while since those two seasons. And then um, the, the next information here that Shade sent us um, sent me on a little bit of a... a a wild goose chase and, and almost uh, has convinced me to spend some money. We'll see if it, we'll see if it happens. So Perfect. I, I will definitely <laughs> nudge you towards that direction if I have to. <laughs> so the Common Order Geeks theme CD is getting released and alongside it is an exclusive version of the beat buckle that can play the opening theme song. Yeah, we need this. <laughs> <laughs> they, they do this every year with the CD releases. It's pretty cool. And I looked it up. And it's the beat buckle, but it's all white, so it looks more like kind of an actual keyboard. Um, and yeah, when you when you press the little buttons, it plays the opening theme song. So it comes with this comes with the CD. Um, I think the CD is maybe just like a CD single. I think it maybe only has like that song on it, like the theme on it. Um, I'm not. I don't. I don't think it's like the entire like, you know. I don't. I don't think it's a full album. Basically, is what I'm saying. Um, to, to get it here, it's going to be a little <laughs> expensive. <laughs> Here's where the problem starts. And it doesn't come out until March. So you could pre-order it now, uh, but then, of course, you wouldn't get it until, until next March. And uh, that's a long time from now. That was the thing that that uh, finally, like, <laughs> talked me off the ledge of, of deciding to get it. Because uh, also, if I, if I get this special beat buckle, I then have to get a driver, too, right? That I can plug it into. I would I think, think so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but it's certainly cool. Um, Shade Shade also sent us, there's a special Christmas buckle too. So (laughs) now now we're in my wheelhouse. We were talking the other day about what the the Christmas special is going to be. Yep. (laughs) Uh, and yeah, there's a, I guess a special Christmas buckle or Christmas, you know, toy every year for Common Rider. I wasn't aware of that, but the one for Geats is it's a bell. (laughs) So you plug the buckle in and then you kind of like ring the bell by turning it sideways. And it says like Christmas. (laughs) It's pretty, it's pretty great. It looks like a cheesy card you get from like CVS almost like it looks like a popcorn tin. It does. It really does. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's not common writery at all. It's like, it's very Christmas and it just happens to plug into the common writer driver. (laughs) Oh wait, what a piece of shit. This is the ad has like a Christmas tin with like it says Merry Christmas all over it has like a sword geats pictures and then it has like him and a little like Christmas star on top of it. And there's this crappy little buckle next to it. And I had to read the description and reading's hard for me sometimes. But it says description. Please note the cake is not included. So it's really just the freaking buckle. And now oh, I'm so not the- as excited. So y- you might be seeing like a reselling website or something. No no no, the- no this is this is tokulectables.com. This is like the real pre-order. I, I just right, but but they're not going to ship you the cake. But if you're in Japan and you are buying it, the get only way to get that buckle that 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 buckle in Japan is buying the cake, and it comes with the cake. Oh, that's way better. Yeah. So so all the 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 Toku Collectibles website is doing is they've they've like bought the cake and are throwing the cake away, <laughs> and are going to ship overseas just the buckle part, basically. Apparently the the buckle as part of its normal it's almost like a normal Geats buckle. If you just said this, I was distracted by the Yeah, pictures. it's just it's so very like, regular. Yeah, it's not like it's not complicated. But so it says all the normal lines, but it also says armed Merry Christmas. <laughs> armed Merry Christmas. So yeah, if if you if you watch videos of the of the toys, because you can't really pick this up in the show as often, but like you plug in a buckle and most of them say like armed whatever their name is or whatever. So yeah, this one goes like armed, Merry Christmas. Um, but yeah, like then it still goes through all the regular buckle noises. Like it does when you plug in any other buckle. So it's like doing all the crazy things and then Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. It's ridiculous and stupid. <laughs> the, the, the farther we get into the show and the more and more toys that come out, 
the more and more I really get invested in this. <laughs> the drivers are fun. I was thinking about the other day. So I have the one from Zio. Um, and I was, I was thinking about how I could like mount that on the wall but still be able to play with it because i think i think that would be ideal for me it's some way to like mount it where it's art (laughs) but then i could walk up and like spin it and do and do its transformation thing so i I need to figure that out because like i'm not gonna like i'm not gonna wear it around like i'm not gonna like wear it to a convention or anything like that um but having it on my wall is just nerdy enough for me (laughs) that's what i'm looking for (laughs) Um, and yeah, speaking of, of Christmas, <laughs> Shade points out that um, in, in our video version of our show um, last time, I was was looking up, I knew I had seen sort of a Kamen Rider Christmas thing. I couldn't remember it very clearly in my head. And then I realized that it was from Kamen Rider X-Aid. Um, so I put an image from that. And um, Jade says, it's pretty funny you included the image of Kamen Rider X-Aid when talking about Christmas, uh, because it's probably the most popular Christmas episode in, in, in Kamen Rider. In that episode, they dropped the huge reveal bomb a couple minutes after a musical number, and somehow it worked wonderfully. So, yeah, the the Common Writer Christmas crossover, um, Common Writer X Aid did a great job at that. Yay, Christmas! <laughs> so, Shade, thanks for the email. Uh, thanks for all of the the trivia, and thanks for making me uh, uh, aware that that the Common Writer Christmas buckle is a real thing. That's very fun. All right, Toby, we watched Common Rider Geats episode 14 for this week. Let's that we jump did. in. Um, this was the continuation of the musical chairs game. If you remember from last week, uh, Punk Jack and Geats do not have their drivers. So Or like we, each other. <laughs> or like each other. That's just <laughs> a given. Yeah, they're not they're not big fans. <laughs> um we talked last week a little bit about like Punk Jack was, you know, set up to, to to be eliminated as well. And, and, you know, would he, uh, would he like that? Is that, is that really sort of what his goal is? He doesn't seem like the type and it opened, this show opens with the game master basically congratulating him and saying like, Hey, you great job. He <laughs> is about to be eliminated. Um, so Punk Jack, I think is happy that he's sort of doing what he was told to do, at least at this point. He's doing his bidding. Yeah. Sumi again is there, but is asking like, is this the best thing? Like eliminating geats like this. And she's have to take a hard stand soon because she is. Yeah. Out of all the slow burn reveals that we always enjoy. Hers might be one of the longest running ones of like, is she actually going to get mad at some point? Like she's obviously irritated with all this and has voiced her irritation multiple times now, but she's really not doing anything past like her first throwaway line of like, Hey, you guys should probably stop this now. That's really about it though. Yeah. I think we're gearing up to them doing all this talking in front of her and like pretending like she doesn't exist. Uh, That that's going to come back to bite them. I think clearly, I think, I think we're, I think we're heading towards her taking a stand, but like right now she very much is like staying impartial and like um, living in that world. But um, I think we, we've seen enough that she seems like a good person outside of her role of just like being impartial and running the game that I, I don't think she'll stand for it for too long, especially as the game master like gets more and more full on evil. (laughs) And we'll, we'll definitely see this episode that that's the direction we are headed (laughs) with the game master. It's funny because during the, the, uh, the prep or the, Pump Jack, you're you're my hero. You're doing the right thing. Talk. Uh, Game Master says Geats has become nothing but an eyesore after all those wins. And to be honest with you, I can maybe understand that vibe of like, this is becoming stupid when the same guy wins every time. So I can understand it from that standpoint. But like when the opposite is the, the opposite side of that is, yeah, he's going to die so that he doesn't get to win anymore. Like that seems like a little outside yeah. the realm of how the game should work. Yeah, it's that's pretty wild. Yeah, we so last week we talked about like kind of the the purpose of the game a little bit. Like the um, the guy in the greenhouse said, like, "Hey, isn't this more fun?" And we talked about the concept of like, is this supposed to be fun? <laughs> like, is is entertainment and enjoyment like the goal that we're getting out of this? And I think some of those things became a bit more clear this episode. So 
you know, we'll we'll kind of fill in the gap sort of as we're going here. But I think for me, this episode, it it seems like the games are very much like Squid Games. If you watched that on uh, Netflix when it came out, so that is. You know, yeah, it's basically people fighting for their lives for the entertainment of like the the rich elite. And I think with all of the like corporations involved and all this talk about the games being fun, because that's what the game master says here as well. Like Geats was an eyesore like he, you know, basically it got boring. He was winning so much. And he says it'll make the game fun again <laughs> if Geats is eliminated. So I think with all the talk of this being fun, it, it feels like that the Desire of Grand Prix sort of the the goal of it isn't necessarily saving the world, but it's like watching people fight for the entertainment of like corporate sponsors or or like the, the rich elite or something like that. I could definitely Um, see that. That that, that would make, that would make sense with how some of this other stuff is working. Yeah. It's just, there's been too many little hints about like things are, things will be fun again. Is it that interesting? Doesn't that make this fun? Uh, Cause yeah, that's exactly what we hear here. Um, we talked about last time, of course, uh, Ace asked to borrow Kawa's driver so that he could get back the driver. That's when he did the big full, uh, command twin buckle transformation this time around. Of course, Ace doesn't have a driver still. Kawa offers to just give up his driver. He says, Hey, you want to, you want to use this? You can borrow it again. When you get yours, you can give it back. And Buffa stops him says like listen no uh you are a rival we're not gonna let you do this <laughs> like like you're being you a little to too stupid again now yeah you need to stop uh, of course punk jack jumps in and agrees and says like hey you've got a pretty op buckle right now maybe you need to hang, hang on to that you're gonna be the big winner <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna be the cool guy <laughs> everyone's pretty torn up though the fact that ace doesn't have a driver um and neon especially so neon asks if he has a trick up his sleeve like basically she's like kind of like pleading like you're you're gonna figure this out right you're gonna stay in the game you're gonna you're gonna do your shit like you always do and you'll be fine correct (laughs) and he doesn't say anything but again he smirks (laughs) 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 which is a little telling so in this episode there, there are kind of several big things that happen and they kind of intersperse sort of as they're going on so i've kind of I've unthreaded it a little bit. So we might talk about a little, some things a little bit out of order, but it sort of puts the events together, if that makes sense. So first up, um, all the fighting begins. Um, we, we get down. Kawa is using the new command twin buckle now that he has it. So Kawa gets his chance to use the raising sword. Um, he charges it all up. You know, he gets to do the whole thing. It's funny because so the actor that was in i'll say the normal tycoon outfit Mm -hmm. versus the actor that's in the outfit when he is the sword man i think it's different people because if you look at the actor in the sword man outfit the dude looks like absolutely like jacked and ripped (laughs) and it doesn't look like uh ko whatsoever like i feel like normally it looks like soul could be in the suit but this dude just looks like he's an absolute like jacked muscle man. It's crazy. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, I uh, I thought generally they try to keep like the same suit actor, you know, for this for each person throughout a season. But like, obviously, it's people in suits. You can't see them. They they totally can switch them. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I wonder if they actually did. I, I I didn't really notice too much of a difference, but I wasn't like really looking out for that. Oh no, Th- these are these are the nice things that go through my mind as I (laughs) enjoy these shows. Okay. Well, looking good. (laughs) (laughs) You got ripped buddy. Um, so of course the, that's, that's one of the three lines in this episode is, uh, Kawa and, and neon and, and, um, Buffa like fighting basically like attempting to, um, to, to beat the Giamato. Cause that's really the, the big goal here. And Buffa's big main driving force is finish this game before Ace gets his buckle back, because I'm going to eliminate Geats from this game. <laughs> I can finally, before, I can before finally pull. I have, can finally pull off the cool guy thing and get rid of him. <laughs> exactly. So we get a lot of cutbacks to them fighting and and seeing the the Giamato. The other big through line in this episode is the interactions between uh, Ace and Hare Ruya. So 
first up, they they meet up, um, and Ace essentially tries to get uh, Punk Jack to kind of spill his guts about the Desire Grand Prix. Uh, we find out that Punk Jack didn't even write anything on his card. He didn't have a wish. He wrote um, no wish in the ultimate power move of I'm just here <laughs> to fuck shit up. Exactly. No wish. Um, and he he then he does tell Ace that he'll get his memories back when he loses. So we find out why he's OK with losing because he clearly had uh, an agreement with the game master that if he loses, he'll get his memories back. You know, it won't he won't have the consequences, basically, of, of losing the game. He had special rules made for him. Yep, exactly. So Ace again, yeah, tries to get him to kind of spill his guts. Tell me about the Desire Grand Prix. Punk Jack, so Ace basically is like, hey, I won't remember anyway. Like, might as well tell me. <laughs> Punk Jack acts like he's going to tell him. And then it's just like, no. Or did you really think I would do that? <laughs> you idiot. <laughs> that was the moment where I thought like, okay, Punk Jack's not so bad. <laughs> <laughs> like, he's, he's pretty good. This episode definitely won me over on Punk Jack for sure. I decided that in this episode that Punk Jack looks like the singer from MXPX. And that is the most random pool I will ever make. Oh, he does. Wow. Yeah, he really does. I'm there (laughs) with you. (laughs) Perfect. I'm totally there with you. (laughs) So again, we we cut back to sort of our first thread, which is the fighting that's happening uh, with Buffa and Kawa. The red hat girl essentially just turns into the Giamato boss. There's some like red mist. And the the mist is essentially um, confusing and obscuring vision. So Buffa thinks he's about to hit the big Giamato boss, but ends up taking out Kawa and Neon on accident. So they can't really see what they're what they're doing. Can't really see what they're they're talking about. I just laughed and I was like, this is the classic. I don't know the proper word for the thing, but like I feel like a lot of tropes are like, Oh no, now you see you think you see someone evil, but it's actually you're attacking your friend. Oh my god. Yeah, I'm glad that wasn't a big a big point this episode. Like it happened, but it wasn't it didn't matter <laughs> really that much. <laughs> I um, like other than like one like one or two throwaway scenes of like, oh you idiot, you hit me. Yeah. And I appreciate that. Because this episode featured a lot of fighting, but the fighting was not the focal point, right? The fighting like was there and like entertained you as the big revelations start dropping. (laughs) So I'm, yeah, I'm very happy. We didn't get like a subplot of like, now I have to figure out how to know who's friend from foe. It's just like, it's, it's fine. Just keep fighting. It'll be, (laughs) it'll be over soon. Yeah. Like overall, I think this is one of the ones that I have had uh, like less notes for. Cause like, I, I feel like a bigger chunk than usual is like the actual fighting parts. And then it's like, Hey, story beat drop. Hey, story beat drop. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I ended up like kind of restructuring how my notes were because it, you know, it didn't make as much sense to like have these things split up the way they were. So the first big story drop that we get to that I want to talk about is the, we cut to the greenhouse guy. We get, we get a little view of the greenhouse guy again. And the greenhouse guy is talking to a Giamato that we haven't really seen yet. He's big. He's he's much taller than, than the regular Giamato. He's big, beefy dude. And he's he's speaking English. The, the greenhouse guy talks about like, oh, your English is getting really good. Your, your speaking is, is, is yeah. really good. He, he obviously is not speaking English. He's speaking Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we find out that he gets named there. He is Rook. So uh, we talked about it in the email section, but the kind of chess theme is uh, is picking up as far as the Giamato go. So it looks like in the future, we're going to be facing off against some larger enemies. You, you, you've uh, you've you've paired up the lead singer of MXPX. <laughs> I, I, I'm, 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 I'm helping Josh as he talks, <laughs> get some uh, get some screenshots for the dumb things I tell him. <laughs> Incredible. Like the look on their face, too, is pretty close in those pictures. It's great. <laughs> so, yeah, that was the that was the first big, big revelation. There is the the Rook thing. Um, another sort of through line in this episode is you know we talked about it but talked about it at the beginning but like neon not really knowing if she can continue on without ace being in the game she's like she doesn't have the confidence 
that's a big through line all the way throughout. Eventually, of course, Kawa gives her a big speech at the end. Um, but it really shows sort of the the friendship, but also like dependence that they've they've come to have on Ace. <laughs> like like they always just sort of like no Ace is going to be there and he's going to save the day. But like, uh oh, what if he's not? <laughs> what, what are we going to do? <laughs> this one time, if our basically our leader, our guide, isn't here to do either of those things for us, like can we function forward? Because I mean, like he basically I'll call it made uh neon kawa like they were both kind of like yeah. timid in the beginning and he's told both of them the right things at the right time to give them the moral support they need to be like full grown players in that regard i guess like yep. ever since the last uh speech geeks gave neon she became the the cool beat buckle user she came back she's like if i want to win i have to try yeah, and, and that's definitely all due to Geats for sure. Yeah, and yeah, the, the same thing with Kwa. Like the couple of um, <laughs> you know backstabs that he did on Kwa only helped to like strengthen Kwa's resolve. You know, all, all of his like genuine advice has been helpful. So yeah, I think both of them. You know, again, spoiler: Geats gets eliminated at the end of this episode. I, um, <laughs> hell of a jump. <laughs> <laughs> so they're gonna have to figure that out i guess if if that if that is a thing that really sticks even for a little bit um geats not being in the game is neon and ky are gonna figure out how to you know uh navigate a game where the other two people are not helping them in any way we uh we we do find a little bit more out about neon and and her father's involvement in the game so one of the things that happens with Neon is she um, she figures out that her bodyguards, who are named John and Ben, uh, are on her side. They're they're loyal to her and not her father. And when she finds this out, she sends them into her father's office to do some digging around. They find in his office ID cores. As soon as they touch them, they regain their memories because. John and Ben used to be common riders. <laughs> <laughs> so we get an awesome scene where they get to go through their henshin. We don't actually see them transform, but like awesome. I love that <laughs> for those two guys that they got to do the whole henshin. Very, very fun. And not even that part specifically, but like to go outside the show a little bit. It's cool that that one actor has been a super fan of the show growing up. He got to be on the show as a bodyguard, yeah. which is a nice touch. Like at least he got to make it on the show. And now at least once he didn't get the outfit, but he got to do it a henshin and be like a rider for a second, yep. which is probably like the greatest like fan fulfill- fulfillment arc you could possibly have. <laughs> yeah. He, um, let me, let me pull up his, his Twitter while we're talking. Actually, both actors are like massive tokusatsu fans. Um, so I think I think for both of them, it um, it was a big thing. <laughs> um, but specifically, John Constantine there, um, which now I'm I'm blanking on what his actual Twitter handle was. So I might have to find it later. Um, but his uh, but I'll, I'll put the image maybe in the video version of, of his tweet. But it um, his his tweet about it was basically like, I got to, I'm like, I can't believe, I still can't believe like I'm in Kamen Rider. And then he's like, I got to, I got to wear a, a buckle. <laughs> I got to say henshin. I got to transform. Like, that's insane. Because <laughs> <laughs> exactly what you were saying. It was him kind of just being like, I can't believe this is my life. <laughs> um, so super cool. And yeah, I think at some point I saw a tweet from the other actor as well, who was kind of saying the same thing. Like he, um, I think he posted some pictures of like him cosplaying as like Power Rangers and stuff in the past. And the fact that now he's like actually in a Kamen Rider show and actually got to kind of do a transformation like insane that these these guys got to do that. Very, very cool. But back in the show, <laughs> the the big part of that revelation basically is that the Karama Corporation is a huge sponsor for the Desire Grand Prix. Why, why does the, the Desire Grand Prix need sponsors? That's the big, <laughs> that's the big question that goes along with this. And there's a lot, of, I mean, there's a entail? lot of tech. There's a lot of tech. So I there can see that be yeah. funding, funding for sure. The cool hackers that have to program the shit. 
you, all, you, need, you need big you need big business for that. You can't just be screwing around having fools like you and I running it. They'd be, they'd be <laughs> shut down in a week. That's fair. That is fair. You definitely don't want you and I in charge of this country. <laughs> you barely want me to play. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was kind of the the first of the big big revelations there, and then cutting back to Punk Jack. Um, we we start to lead into our big huge round of revelations. So we find out a lot of stuff kind of all at once here. So the first to kind of set this up is that Punk Jack calls the game master and kind of is like confirming that he's gonna get an ID core after he loses so he can regain his memories. And the game master's like, What? <laughs> Punk Jack's like, Oh, you know, like like you promised, like I'd get my I've altered the deal. My- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. So the game master alters the deal. <laughs> basically tells punk jack pray i pray i do not alter it further <laughs> <laughs> he says uh consider it penalty for making the um to, for m- making it known to geats basically that punk jack was in the game to eliminate him and uh the game master says that basically if you want your memories back then quote contribute to world peace by playing the game and winning so of course that angers punk jack he now is and on the a redemption mission. arc begins. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so he heads back in the game. He's looking for a driver. Now he encounters Ace once again because Ace saves him. So he um, is about to get just completely murked by one of the Giamato riders and Ace kind of pulls him to safety. After this, they start talking again. And now, unlike before, uh, Punk Jack is, is definitely ready to spill the beans and we get some big revelations. So the first one is that Ace's mom, uh, Mitsume, was a navigator of the games before Sumi. So sometime before Sumi, uh, Ace's mom was actually a Desire Grand Prix employee, and she served the role of navigator. Ooh. So then maybe Sumi's Geese's sister, we just don't know. (laughs) Could be, yeah. Uh, We also get like kind of the mini sub-revelation that Ace... Um, wished to become the kind of star of stars of stars um, just to hope that his mom would see him and try to contact him. Like if I'm the biggest star in the world, then if my mom's still out there, she'll see me on TV. She'll, she'll see me around and she'll try to get a hold of me. Which and is the she, most endearing way of that douchey wish. Yeah. To actually be like the wish. I can't believe they found a way, not found a way. I'm sure it was the intention all along, but they, they redeemed that, wish like (laughs) like i thought it was just him being like yeah like like you said like a jerk like just him being full of himself but like no there was a reason he was trying to get his mom to call him that's amazing and it's funny because like it even goes ties to the fact that like so the the, i wish you guys were my family thing obviously had the i want to get close to these idiots and see what what they're trying to pull here but that means like maybe most of his wishes for as far back as we know as weird or douchey or like up his own ass as they seemed, they probably all actually have like actual ties back to like, I just want to know where the fuck my mom is. Yeah. I don't, it doesn't seem like now that he probably had any wishes that were like just for, just for kicks. <laughs> um, like we may, maybe assumed that some of them were, yeah, I bet they were all like very intentional getting him closer to information and stuff. Because as as you see this episode, like he is driven in finding out information. <laughs> Punk Jack uh, tells us that his grandpa is actually the president of a huge corporation. So another corporation. And his grandpa gave Punk Jack a job with the Desire Grand Prix. Punk Jack was in debt because he'd been trying to make his music career take off and it wasn't working. So because of that, he starts working with the DGP. He does say that he's low level still, so he doesn't know everything. And, and uh, then he, he says Ace will have to talk to the game master for more questions. And then finally, Ace confirms that Yorori is the game master, that they're they're one and the same. Ace kind of knew it going in, though. <laughs> so yeah, there's no again, way at this point. Ace's little smirk <laughs> there um, tells us that he definitely knew that that was the case. And then at the end of this, which I thought was really great, um, these two have this moment. They sort of get a little bit closer. We talk about the redemption arc. And then turns out Ace lost his driver on purpose. He let Buffa pick it up instead of getting it to it in time, just so he could, you know, align with Punk Jack and get this information out of Punk Jack. <laughs> so and it was all a play. 
which is why he smirked last time because he always easily always two steps ahead. Yeah, he's he's always at least one episode ahead. <laughs> he's very wise. So Ace and Funk Jack there kind of decide like, listen, you got screwed by the game master, but keep fighting. Like that's what you need to do. So they head out, they find two buckles, but they're confronted by the game master. Dun, dun, dun. Ace, of course, calls him Yurori. The game master removes his mask, so all uh, all pretense is gone. He's uh, he's definitely his his true self now in front of Ace, and he henshins. So <laughs> Yurori is a common writer. That was our last big reveal here. He transforms into common writer Glare, with Glare- possibly the coolest uh, driver buckle. Yeah. out of all of them and the um, way his whole shit works is fantastic so yeah explain a little bit of like how his buckle works and kind of what it does so it looks i guess more like a cell phone or like yeah kind of it's like it's like a big um like a big led screen sort of yeah like it has, i guess yeah. that's probably the most accurate way to do it but he has, um, it looks like almost like computer chips that he uses to like slide in and out of the buckle. Yeah. Which is more cool stuff to sell as toys. And then all of his moves, I find it cool that like they're all computer driven in some way, shape or form. Mm-hmm. Like, let me try to look some up here quick. Yeah. So I actually wrote down all the things that his, his buckle says. So, okay. Well then, so I'll have to look it up. Go for it. <laughs> it says he like for first when he transforms and like kind of scans the car or whatever, it says install. And then like, as the henchin's happening, it says dominate a system. <laughs> <laughs> um, as he's going, like one of his big kicks, it says delete. And then, um, when he takes over punk Jack. So at some point he basically takes over punk Jack kind of like makes him a, uh, um, a weird zombie dude kind of when he's doing that, it says like hacking on. And yes, then it says, that was the really good one. Start. <laughs> <laughs> the crack uh, start ones that made me laugh where it's like, <laughs> I mean, at that point, like it's truly all just like programmer gaming stuff. Yep. Like I'm going to crack the game. So it works the way I want it to blah, blah, blah. And, I'm I'm really glad you you liked all that stuff so much too because yeah like when when he transformed I thought he looked cool and then when it started in as all the computer stuff I was like I'm in he's my favorite common writer now this is great <laughs> I want nothing more than a common writer to say hacking on <laughs> <laughs> just fantastic um, I think he looks really cool too I really like the like red accents kind of all around him. He's got really, really cool like antenna like the common writer have often. I think his look really good. I was gonna say um, like, at least from my, in the beginning when we like, I have next to no real base knowledge of common writer stuff, but he looks more like what I thought the writers looked like than yeah. like the writers do in the season. Yeah. I think he's definitely, he's much more, uh, not traditional because he, he doesn't look like the original common writer necessarily um, too, too closely, but like he definitely is more of like a headline writer. Like you would think, or like, you know, he's, he's closer to what Geats might look like when, when Geats is in full on like Magnum mode, right? Like I've got all my stuff on, I'm ready to go. Like I'm at, I'm at max power. Um, and he speaking of power seems to be very powerful. <laughs> he, uh, <laughs> he, picks up punk jack and holds him upside down by his before head. <laughs> by his head before he does the big delete kick and then like i said he hacks punk jack and kind of makes punk jack do his bidding once again the hacking is a really cool visual so it flies over like his chest comes off it flies over it knocks the helmet off of punk jack and then replaces it itself it, like it puts it on the the helmet and then now punk jack is under control because he's got this sort of like weird hacking helmet on it's a cool visual um because it literally knocks off the old helmet and, and is, is becomes the new helmet um, and this is one of the episodes too where like a lot of the fight visuals like we went back and forth like this looks like good this looks like shit over the past couple of weeks and most of this episode doesn't look like it's cg for like the action itself Mm-hmm. but there's like crazy drone shots and if that's the case like again like most of this episode is just fights interspersed with all the lore dumps but like they all just look so crazy where i was impressed again i was like the show looks cool as hell 
Yeah. Yeah. We, we kind of, you know, maybe we're doing a disservice by not talking too much about the fighting in this episode, but you're, you're right. It does look awesome. Um, there, the drone shots, this isn't really a knock against it, but you could, you could recognize clearly when they were using a drone because the footage is a little bit lower quality. You can tell, um, which isn't a huge deal, but it gives it an interesting look. So they, they, they do a little bit more like effects over the screen when they're showing the drone footage. But because of that, you get some like insane, like whipping around over the action, under the action scenes um, that, yeah, they can do with like completely practical instead of like making it CG, which is great. I will take slightly low quality drone footage over CG effects any day. Like that's yeah, exactly. so much better. Um, and yeah, it feels like the action. This whole series has been like really top notch, I think for Kamen Rider, like all the fights have been amazing. All the choreography has been really, really amazing. Um, but it feels like they continue to get better. Like, you know, they have figured out, you know, how to limit the CG as much as possible. And like the choreography just keeps getting crazier and crazier. Like all the stuff this episode with all the drone footage we talked about, um, the stuff last episode where like where they were fighting in kind of the church area and all the crazy like tag team maneuvers that Kawa and Ace were doing together. Um, it just really feels like it's firing on all cylinders at this point. It hits a stride. Yeah, truly, truly. So yeah, we we end this episode. So so Ace, of course, had a driver in his hand. Punk Jack now under the control of Common Rider Glare punches ace ace drops the driver meanwhile kawa defeats the Giamato boss with his um command twin buckle and ends the mission so ace was not in possession of a driver as the game ended and geats gets eliminated so he at the end of this episode he fades away and does the little like blue fade away thing like we've seen in the past the and it ends. We we get to the black screen sort of rules of the DGP, and the thing that they show us is that the game master should not interfere with the game. <laughs> <laughs> He's not permitted to change the outcome. Yeah, <laughs> but you know he can he can transform and take over one of the competitors, and you know whatever. It's that's all good. <laughs> yeah, it's not really like I think out of all the rules that they've showed so far, like if I know the rules are usually like the short summary of the episode. Um, but obviously they're also like the actual rules of the games. Yeah. And like, this is the most obvious glaring blatant one of like, yeah, the dude does not, he's, he's way past the, the point of no return with, yes, I'm affecting what's going on now. Absolutely. Yeah. The, 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 the reveal of common writer glare. I, uh, like it's obvious now thinking back about it, like, Oh yeah, the game master is going to, going to become a writer. Like that does make sense, but I did not see it coming. Like I figured, <laughs> I figured the game master would be more like a pull the strings behind the scenes type of guy. Um, and then, yeah, maybe if he transforms, it's going to be like at the end of the season, he's going to be big boss becomes a writer gets defeated. The fact that like right now, <laughs> again, episode 14 he is fully out in the open as like evil dude, common writer glare, eliminating geats. Like it's going to be wild seeing sort of where they go from that. Like does does he get ousted as, as game master now? Like do the corporation step in because he's taken this in a crazy step of actually becoming a common writer and, and, and like, you know, getting involved. Um, lots like of, just, lots of possible layers. Of where this yeah, for sure. Point. Yeah. The, the open hostility now that's going to be between uh, between the game master and between Gates is just wild to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, crazy, crazy episode. I'm really, really excited about about seeing further episodes. I was seeing some some talk on Twitter that like the next couple episodes, uh, which are out yet, but you and I have not watched are just as good, if not better than this. So like I hate I'm, when you fuckers do this. We talked about this. <laughs> you all fucking do this to me. Oh, I can't. I, I've read. Don't, don't you watch the previews? No. no. Oh, my God. It looks so good, though. No, shut the fuck up. <laughs> I don't know anything that happens. Like, I, I've, I've definitely stayed free of spoilers of those, but I uh, I, I have heard that it's exciting. <laughs> That's <Okay>. all. <laughs> <laughs> that was fair. <laughs> uh, yeah, super, super fun stuff. All right. I think it's going to wrap up our uh, our discussion of Common Gates episode 14. 
Uh, thanks very much for, for listening along. If you want to check out all of our past episodes, uh, either search for us in your favorite podcasting app or go to commonwritersucks.com for the YouTube playlist of all of our past episodes. As we talked about, we put up kind of visuals of what we're talking about as we go through it. Well, that's a fun way to, to take in the shows. You can also, of course, send us an email um, as Shade did this week. Send those emails to cast at commonwritersucks.com. And of course, between episodes, you can keep up with Toby and I uh, in various places on the internet. Uh, Toby, where can the people find you at? On Twitter, it's at Life of Tobes, T O B E S. And on YouTube, it's at Tobes Plays. Awesome. You can find me on Tumblr and on Twitter. I am at Pretty Dece Josh at both places. That's P R E T T Y D E C E J O S H. So again, we'll be back for Geats episode 15 next week. Um, Just ramping up the excitement. Hopefully you'll join us back for that episode as well. Until then, have a great week. Peace. I'm taking shots at the enemy. I'm going to make it to the top, leave a legacy. If I got something to say, you better let me speak. Turn it up a new degree. Bitch, you ain't seen anything. I pop off with the new rock. Electric.